Each year, the Africana Studies Program uses this event to focus on the intellectual and cultural traditions of Africa and the Caribbean. This year, we have chosen to commemorate the 15th anniversary of the execution of Nigerian writer, television producer, and activist, Ken Sarawiwa. His outspoken resistance to crude oil extraction and decades of indiscriminate petroleum <laughs> waste dumping in his homeland of Agonaland in the Niger Delta cost him his life. He was hanged at the age of 54 by the military government on November 10, 1995. To offer us insight into the life and work of Sarawiwa, we are pleased to have Professor Ogaga Ifoado, poet and writer who teaches poetry and literature at Texas State University, San Marcos. He holds a Master of Fine Arts in Poetry and a PhD from Cornell University. Before he embarked upon his life as an academic, Dr. Ifoado studied law at the University of Benin and worked for eight years as a rights activist with Nigeria's premier non-governmental rights group, the Civil Liberties Organization, known as the CLO. Between 1997 and 1998, Professor Ifoado was held in preventive detention for six months under the military dictatorship of General Sani Abacha, the same dictator responsible for Sarawiwa's murder. A memoir of his prison experience, excerpts from which have been featured in Gathering Seaweed, African Prison Writing, New Writing 14, Nigeria's Vanguard newspaper, and African Writing um, is in progress. And we were talking about it at lunch, and he's finished, I think, one or two parts of it and is anxious to get back to work on it. In addition, Professor Ifoado has published three prize-winning books of poetry, the first entitled Homeland and Other Poet Poems, the second Madiba, and the third The Oil Lamp. His poems have been translated into German, Dutch, and Romanian, and have also been widely published in anthologies and magazines, included Voices from All Over, Poems with Notes and Activities, Oxford University Press 2006, Step Into a World, a Global Anthology of the New Black Literature, John Wiley 2000, and the Times Literary Supplement, Poetry International, English in Africa, and the Massachusetts Review. He has made his fiction debut in Agni with the story The Treasonable Parrot. He is a recipient of both the Penn USA Barbara Goldsmith Freedom to Write Award and the New Word Award of Poets of All Nations based in the Netherlands. An honorary member of the Penn Centers of the, U of the USA, Germany, and Canada, Professor Ifoado is also a fellow of the Iowa Writing Program. We are delighted to have Professor Ogaga Ifoado join us today. I'd like you to join me in welcoming him. background and to prepare us for Professor Ifoado's remarks, we will screen a few minutes of excerpts from the documentary Crude Impact. We will then hear from Professor Ifoado, who will entertain questions at the end of his talk. I lastly wanted to say thank you to the Cultural Studies Program, the Concentration in Writing and Rhetoric, and the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies for co-sponsoring this event, and thank you to all of you for coming. I want to thank this university, Dr. Crystal Lucky, Dr. Chris uh, Chiji Akoma, my good friend from Nigeria, for inviting me here to share this moment with you. And like I said, thank you for taking time from your busy schedules to be here. Since time is of the essence, I'm going to try to go straight to what I have in mind. I'll give a short reading from my last book of poems called The Oil Lamp, which after this I need not give you any background to, is about the Niger Delta. Because these are the gas flaring stacks that you saw on the cliff, the back and the cover of it. 
is my own legal attempt to bear witness to the atrocities that went on before the book was written and are still going on now, even to an increased intensity as we sit here. After that, I will talk on a topic I call towards a psychoanalysis of the dysfunctional post-colonial nation state. I will try to give the reason why I've taken that topic which seems to diverge from the focus of the day, which is a Niger Delta, an enclave that is part of Nigeria, why I've extended it to the whole concept of the post-colonial nation state. I hope it comes through by the time I'm done with the talk. The first poem I'm going to read is called A Waterscape. <coughs> and it's an attempt to paint what you might call an idyllic, an idyllic picture of the Niger Delta before oil extraction, pollution, degradation turned it to the ecological disaster that it is now. After that, what I did in the, in the book is to take some very well-known flashpoints, main incidents in the Niger Delta, which represent the attempt by the federal government in collusion with the oil cattle, Shell, Chevron, Texaco, uh, Ajip, Mobile, all of them that are busy making profits by billions of dollars to suppress the agitations of the people in the Niger Delta. So you know about Ogoni already. In 1999, there was Odi when the, the new civilian regime of General Obasanjo sent a punitive expedition to Odi and flattened the entire community, the town. Because according to the government, four security, four policemen and I think about four soldiers have been kidnapped and possibly murdered. And therefore, this was a teacher for lesson. Then I will also uh, conclude with a tribute to Kensar Weaver and the Ugoni Age. So the first poem is called A Water Scape. <coughs> Hung above water, hands in the air, whiter tongues and breathing fibrous hair, roots, white mangrove roots. Blacker than pear, deeper than soot. Massive inkwell, silent and mute. Water, black water. Floating hearts of lily, yellow plume. Plankton and shrimp, egg and fish in bloom. Lakes, ancestral lakes. Rich mud of eels, water holes of crab. Sink place for fisher of dig and grab. Bug, mud skipper's bug. And in the mangrove swamps, where tides free the creeks of weeds, fishermen glide home to the first meal. Now, this section of the poem, Jesse, I'm going to read, is about a fire tragedy, pipeline fire tragedy that occurred in 1998 during uh, a period of acute fuel scarcity. So when there was a breach in a pipeline, the locals went there to siphon fuel. And in the process, there was a fire. Officially, a 1,000 people died. But we know that, of course, the official figures are a lie. So more than a 1,000 died. We, they did not even mention the maimed and those who were psychologically, you know, uh, uh, damaged. But this is a lament by a 90-year-old woman, which closes this section, it's in 15 uh, uh, sections, which closes that part of the poem called J.C. Madam Adoja, 90 years of age, 50 years a widow, since her husband fell off a rig and drowned at sea, sat in a makeshift tent 
called for water to quench the fire still raging in her throat and broke 90 days of silence with a sound. Oil is my chorus. Oil is our doom. Where is my husband? Where, my holy love? At the bottom of the sea. The bottom of the sea. Oil is my course. Oil is our doom. Where is the fish for palm oil soup? Dead in the creeks. Dead in the lakes. Oh, mate, do you have a cup of gari to lend me for the children's sake? Not even a cup. Not even a handful. The fields are tired where cassava once grew. You know the fields are tired and harder than the shell. Too hard for our bones. Oil is my cross. Oil is our doom. Where are my children? Where is my husband? Ashes and bones. Ashes and bones. I will read two sections from the poem Odi where after the bombing, uh, in the course of the bombing, the, the inhabitants have been driven into the bush to take cover in the bush. So I will read two sections where they are in flight to the bush and they are already in the bush and what happens. Dawn, I mean, this is the next morning. I mean, uh, the next morning, that is part of it is the next morning. Um, after a night in the bush. Down, bear their states of undress, mocked the woman's peasant propriety. As homes crumbled and the bush waved in vain, his green scarves for peace. They huddled under trees and counted a bomb when the ground shook till it rumbled as if the god of thunder had changed his throne. Fear still the ungovernable mouths of babies strapped to backs with bedspreads, grabbed by instinct at the moment of flight. Crickets out shouted, scurried in dazed circles around children too stunned to stretch out a hand until hunger matched fear, and the men far from yam of fish turned insect hunters, wide root diggers. Banished from fire by fire, they ate their food fresh. It was dark when they fled their beds, dark again when they knelt in silence, prayed the invaders to accept victory and go home. But the red ground trembled, the sky rumbled, and the trees waved again in vain. They heard a thud in a clump of bamboo. Then the tea black water of the lake they had drunk for a night and a day exploded. They scattered with a muddy splash deeper into the bush. Shells shocked, babies and children smothered the instinct to cry and clammed to backs and shoulders. And he held that hand, brave as their parents, clinging to the hope of return to their homes, crosshair by the demolition man, as they sought cover under leaves in a shuddering forest. The air shrieked behind them, and a walnut tree, a moment ago their home, cleaved into two by another bomb, crashed, lashing a mother and child at the back line of flight. And now the children, bored, and their parents, finding words for the terror, cried, We are dead! We are dead! Save us, O oh God! From the section of Ogoni, I'm going to, from the poem Bogoni, I'm going to read a section where we saw the memo the, from the River State Internal Security Task Force. At the time that came out, I was still working with the civil liberties organization, so I saw a copy of that memo too. Major Okutimo, Paul Okutimo, who led that task force, actually boasted, and this was on Channel 4, British Television at the point. It was free. They did a, uh, a documentary on the Ogoni, and they actually showed him boasting. I know 221 ways to kill a man. So he boasted his ways of killing, how he would surround the town and drive everybody into the bush and posted. I drove everybody into the bush. So this section, this section I'm going to read is in his voice. Actually, the whole of this poem is a kind of dramatic monologue 
in the voice of Major Kutimo, who for his labors was promoted colonel when he was done with the stint uh, on, the, on the task force. I preferred the nights when oil lamps twinkled over the evening tide catch in wet nets, fish women smelling of old poison, and buyers bent like shrimps over trays and mats, haggled over prizes without a care. We would surround the town, but keep the roads clear. At my word, big guns would go off. And at first, the fish market, always a hubbub equal to the sea's roar, would be dead still, and you could hear a lamp, its oil drying, splutter its rage, or the chink of change dropped by shot hands. We paused for the oil to revive them, till we saw them flick away the fish as if they were marine bombs. We sustained fire then, till all the lambs gasped and surrendered to night, till only the light of our fire streaked in the bloated darkness as houses quenched their lamps to hide their fear, and their occupants fled to the bush through the paths I had kept, I had kept open. Um, I, I was going to read two more sections about it. I guess I will skip that and go to a section that gives the reason for the title of this poem beyond what you see visually. Or, well, this is a fisherman you know, referring to that. The oil lamp meaning, meaning the gas flurry stacks that are burning night and day and cast a, a pale, you know, a sickly glow in the night. And the heat also that comes from it, which devastates the economy around it, the, the ecosystem around it. Now, I come from the Niger Delta, and I've seen this. Both from my mother's hometown and my father's hometown in the Niger Delta, there are gas flurry stacks. So, these are things that are more or less uh, signposts of my childhood. They scrapped for a living where the land's promise was boundless ease. The fisherman throws his net, rejoices for a single, a single meal's catch as trawlers hauling schools of fish. Tankers whose docking and living make his canoe rock to the wild tune of their wakes, sail away with bonny lights crude. And far from the lighted jetty, he paddles home by the flame of iron dragon, the gas flaring stack whose awful mouth spits fire without seas near his village. Born before the first built by shell, he too had cursed the dragon called it Hell's Gorge, sure to wretch on every head, afflictions and deaths sucked on the depths of the earth. Till the woman found his oven heat perfect for drying tapioca, till he, in the absence of electric light, renamed the red tongues snarling at the inky skies, oil lamps of the Delta. I will close the reading with a uh, tribute to Ken Sarawiwa. And the tribute of Ken Sarawiwa in the Ogoni 8, which was originally published in the Massachusetts Review, is in four parts. In the first, two part, in the first part <coughs> is kind of uh, the poet persona speaking about the, uh, the difficulty of evil pretending to represent the tragedy. The second part, turns the focus on Ken Sarawiwa and how he would not let, how he could not afford not to bear witness. The third part is General Abacha, who, as you know, died uh, for reasons I'm sure those of you who pay, will be paying attention know. Um, and then the fourth part is the poet persona again as a kind of commentary on Abacha and every despot's fear of alternative voices. Let us pretend we can write it. Let us pretend we can write it, using words that flare with the air from the tightening news to maintain their ground. Words that floated belly up in the creek 
their eyes coated with the ash and the fire beneath. Let us flit to the hair, the magic mourner plucked from her head, the world that's cry and lost and curse, and ask forgiveness for those that mocked. For where is the world, and where is the hand to match the heart that bleeds alone? Don't ask. Pray only to trace the silence and the scream, and fix to a spot of earth which the murderer denies the matter, the echo with which our cry hallows their death. Memory was his savior and his death. Memory was his savior and his death. He remembered the swamps and the rivers, the fish shivering in choked nets, the colony of creeks and moss keepers founded by retreating tides, and the farms swollen with roots and balls. He remembered a bounty whose splendor wrote songs chanted by the peasants to winds and birds. Memory was his savior and his death. He had known the floods, the tides, and the waves that softened the land and brought the fish home. At one with nature's law, they left no graves. He came to know the black springs of the fuel oil, spewing liquid fire from iron pythons coiled like rigs of death round their love and toil. He came to know cities floated on the oil, plundered on the land under his feet, where councils held in big halls to share his spoils. And memory became his savior from death. When the housewife stood aghast by her plot of cassava and herbs swallowed by slick, when trees, fish, and animals in mourning surrendered to acid rain and gas poison, when the canoe paddling children to school capsized far from bridge or motorway, when the army invaded the village, shooting, bombing, burning, raping, laughing, when the commander of the mob boasted 221 ways to kill a man, Memory became his savior from the death when he bore witness to the rape and the shame. Hurry them down into the grave. Hurry him down. Hurry them down into the grave. Hurry them down before their bones nail my guilt. Now my eyes are redder than the blood I have spilled, and my vision no further than my gilded chair recedes into my head to blaze forth my fear. Hurry them down into the grave. Hurry, hurry! Time marches against me swifter than the horse. Before their blood cools, warm the witches, they must be in their grave. Hurry into the grave to bury the corpse and their cause. So the burning creek and swamp may stand still for the drilling rig, its foot planted in the core of their earth by the ace lifter. Hurry them down, hurry them down! The witches prescribe sacrifice. At Ramadan, I will prove my faith by spawning Allah's grace to slip man and ram. Hurry, hurry! The world closes around me, and I see Ken's spirit singing. His pipe, now a gun, pointed at me, and I quail with a terror I cannot describe. Hurry him down, hurry them down into the grave. Time races against me, swifter than the horse. And my eyes, redder than the blood I have spilled, grow too heavy for my face. Hurry to the grave before my barrel runs over with the last drop. Hurry, hurry, and save me from the brave. The good pupil. Years of steady understudy had cleared the needed footpath through his, the gross thicket of his mind. Too feeble for sums or spelling, he would excel in turning guns to crickets, to shrill wildly across the land, abiding his time, learn through fear to be the feared. Luckily for him, he was in the right place where poetry, philosophy, or kissing are alien arts, where booty and the honors of state are with the unquestioning murderer who ponders only when and how. 
its eyes with glitter like rubies of blood and blaze its name. One moment came it wrapped in the folds of a fool's robe when his country dangled from the web of his ex-master's plots. He needed no speeches pressed in the false moves of learning and wisdom, only threats angled to strike deepest at the wound. With frayed cloths and blistering pepper, he would bind the gash, raw and red, festering beneath his bayonet. He steadied his nerves, downing endless shots of his gin and blood cocktail pressed from the earth by the barrel, opening to the quick maggot his slowed liver and his stone called his heart. But he always had a crippling fear to staunch, so he could claim valor in the mask of a soldier's kit. And like a school bully, one dare with a heart proved too great a task for his nerves. And fleeing into the valley of bones he broke, he learned well this lesson. Now, I will turn to my talk. The thrust of it is this. The post-colonial state was a product of world historical violence, a catastrophe. For those of you familiar with the narrative of the coming into being of the post-colonial state, Nigeria as a case point, things fall apart. You understand the extent of this catastrophe. The white man is very clever. He came peaceably and quietly with his religion. But we are amused at his foolishness and allowed it to stay. Now he has put a knife on the things that held us together and we are falling apart. That falling apartness honorizes that catastrophe. Now, for those of you who may also know Wale Shoeka's Death and the King's Horseman, we dramatize the clash between. Uh, the white invader and the African community of your, your kingdom represented there. It marks the end <coughs> of the Yoruba war as a mute. And in fact, the lament at the beginning of the play is in the, in the past, the slavers came and went, but our, our clan was never turned off his course, you know. And the fear, the apprehension at the beginning is what is realized at the end. So the question I want to ask, uh, I have some answer here is. Did colonialism, a world historical catastrophe, leave only physical material damage in its wake, or did it also cause mental, psychological injury that we have not yet paid sufficient attention to? If we answer yes, that it, came, it, it created a trauma, which, and again, I'm taking my cue in a lot of ways, from Jewish Holocaust studies, who have adopted the framework of trauma in the most in its literary analysis. But I, found, I find a galling absence of that in post-colonial studies. So what I'm going to do, I hope, let me look at the clock there. I think I have enough time to read this. So as not to, so you can more easily follow my argument. I'm going to read the, uh, the notes I have here. So the first part of it is just to give, to make the link between why, from why I'm casting further a, tree, a, a field when the ostensible occasion for our gathering here today is the Niger Delta of Nigeria. I hope to uh, make it clear to you why I'm doing this. Given that the focus of the Senghor Damas Cesare lecture series this year is the troublesome Niger Delta of Nigeria, in commemoration of the judicial murder on 10 November 1995 of Kenule Sarawiwa and the Ogoni 8, let me begin by explaining why I have complicated my task by choosing a far wider topic as evident in my title. The Niger Delta crisis, as any careful observer knows, <coughs> is a microcosm of the national question, which is the intractable problem of forging a nation out of a disparate amalgam of ethnic nationalities that did not exist as one polity before the colonial misadventure. Put another way, it is asphyxian riddle of converting 
He quotes now, a mere geographical expression, to quote one founding father of Nigeria, or, quote, the mistake of 1914, to quote yet another, into an autonomous act of union. How do we bring all these people who never existed as one nation, on our polity, together as a nation? That is a national question. And the Niger Delta is, is a microcosm of that. If we find the answer to this riddle, Nigeria as we currently know it, we die. And out of its decomposing corpse will come a nation to command the loyalty of the people of the Niger area, which is what Nigeria means, the people of the Niger, River Niger area. But we are still in the present. And as Sarawiwa's forerunner, Major Isaac Boro, foresaw before launching his 12-day revolution to free the Creeks, it was, quoting him, it was crystal clear that the oil-rich Niger Delta had become the booty of Nigeria, unquote. In this, homegrown exploiters merely carry on Lord Lugard's purpose in cobbling the country together. Every colony, after all, is only the booty of the colonizer. The cold calculation to seize the Niger Delta by any means necessary for the self-enrichment or the new power elite was disclosed by, regrettably enough, regrettably enough, a Niger Delta you know, Indian, a former super permanent secretary in the Gowon regime, and who later became the secretary for petroleum you know, in one of the new transition uh, governments that followed the military, Philip Asiodo. After paying lip service to the plight of the Niger Delta, he went on to say, given, however, the small size and populations of the Niger, or the oil producing areas, it is not cynical, it is not cynical to observe that even if the resentments of oil producing states continue, they cannot threaten the stability of the <coughs> country nor affect its continued economic development. Unquote. Now, a more honest uh, public servant, the late Bola Ige, who was assassinated under the regime of General Basanjo, as when Bolaiki was serving Attorney General, and to death, till death, as we speak, his murderers are not be found. One of the key suspects actually was sprung from detention to contest election to become a senator. Now, that figure, Bola Ige, put it more bluntly. According to him, the rest of Nigeria has been stealing from the Niger Delta. Now, this naked thievery, compounded by the devastating effects of oil and gas extraction on the environment and the livelihood of the people, not to mention the brutal suppression of protests from Boros insurrection to the Ogoni tragedy under Abacha, the OD punitive expedition under Obasanjo, the military siege laid to the Niger Delta, all, uh, starting from General Babangida and subsisting till now. All of these have turned that wetland into an internal colony of Nigeria. Andrew Rowell, James Marriott, and Lauren Stockman in their book, The Next Gulf, trace a larger colonial picture. They remind us that while colonialism may be dead, neo-colonialism, globalization or neoliberalism, take your pick, call it whatever you want, is still very much alive. And its fans are even sharper now especially for the resources of the third world. As a consequence of the unappeasable Middle East conflict that renders access to Persian Gulf oil unsteady, the United States has blatantly declared the Gulf of Guinea, which is the West African coast, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Nigeria, down that coast, a, uh, 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 a place of national security interest. So some of the goings on in the Niger Delta are actually with the connivance of the military intelligence community here in the United States. So Rowell see a continuation of the triangular transatlantic slave in, in slaves, that trade in slaves that was depopulated and devastated the, the Guinea coast in the new dispensation. Because now the locus of power for pet or, or, or the pet for the uh, uh, 
petroleum resources, how it is mined, how it is sold, how it is shared, who gets what? It's not really Nigeria. It is London, Washington, with Abuja playing 10 feet old, if not even 10 or 100 feet old. <laughs> this reminder of the colonial origins of the Niger Delta crisis makes it imperative that we explore all possible avenues of understanding. In doing so, within the primary disciplinary enclave for interpreting the formerly colonized world, that of post-colonial studies, we are bound to discover a discomforting fact, that of a gap constituted by the dearth of psychological approaches. Yet, one cannot but answer in the affirmative the question, did colonialism, world historical catastrophic event, inflict only material physical damage on the colonized, or did it also cause mental psychological injury? Now, long before post-colonial studies became a discipline, Franz Fanon declared that, quote, only a psychoanalytical interpretation of the black problem can lay bare the anomalies of affect that are responsible for the structure of the complex, unquote. Now, Fanon would emerge as a canonical figure, as you know, in the field, even spawning an academic cottage industry, memorably described by Henry Louis Gates Jr. as a critical Fanonism. But much of this criticism ignores the essence of Fanon's call for a social diagnostic, a psychoanalytic interpretive tool informed by social and economic realities. What follows, therefore, in my talk, is a call for a return to the psychoanalytic France Fanon of black skin, white masks, who tends to be obscured by the assumed prophet of violence in the wretched of the earth, often without regard to the fact that he not only ends his brief but illustrious career with that so-called handbook of revolution, but remarkably also ends it with a chapter entitled Colonial Wars and Mental Disorders. Notably, Fanon remarks that perhaps the chapter will be found, quote, ill-timed and singularly out of place, unquote. But that, again, quoting him, we cannot do anything about that. <coughs> or we can do nothing about that. So this section I'm going to talk about now is called reading post-colonial history or narrative as a history narrative of trauma. What would that mean? What then might it mean to read post-colonial history as a history of a trauma, as not merely a verifiable record of imperialist atrocities, but also of the resultant trauma to the psyche of the colonized? In which case, we are confronted by non-empirical mental processes lodged in the murky recesses of the unconscious. Before essaying an answer, let us recall that Fanon is not alone in urging this mode of investigating the post-colonial predicament. Edouard Glissant, <coughs> Glissant, who is also from, I think, Martinique, you know, the same country that Fanon you know, uh, came from, uh, said, uh, said this, uh, said the following, when also urging that we adopt a psychoanalytic approach, or at least he didn't use the word psychoanalysis precisely, but that's the effect of it. Now, quoting him. Would it be ridiculous to consider our lived history as a steadily advancing neurosis? To see the slave trade as a traumatic shock, our relocation in the new, new land as a repressive phase, slavery as a period of latency, emancipation in 1848 as reactivation, our everyday fantasies as symptoms, and even our horror of returning to those things of the past as a possible manifestation of the neurotic sphere of his past? Would it not be useful and revealing to investigate such a parallel? What is repressed in our history persuades us, furthermore, that this is more than an intellectual game. But even when not advancing a plain psychoanalytic approach, it is implicit in the most thoughtful responses to Africa's post-independence crisis. Thus, Chinua Achebe, 
very early on defined his mission as a novelist in words that he echo final. Quote, here then is an adequate revolution for me to espouse, to help my people regain confidence in themselves and put away the complexes of the years of denigration and self-abasement. Achebe asks usefully that it would be foolish, quoting him, it would be foolish to pretend that we have fully recovered from the traumatic effects of our first confrontation with Europe. These complexes of traumatic neuroses, or traumatic neuroses, are buried, according to him, in the soul, which are likened to the political unconscious. This revolutionary project is what the Kenyan Ngugi wa Thiongo devotes himself to under the name decolonizing the mind. It is what that great balladeer of Nigeria and Africa's post-colonial angst, Fela and Nicola Mukuti, called now at this part of he calls it colo mentality, which is like pigeon English. And this part of it, I'm going to say it in pigeon, but I'll do a translation if you need a translation. And where he sings, the verses where he sings. Colo mentality. If you say you be colonial man, it don't be tea before before. They don't release you now, but you never release it yourself. <laughs> Meaning, okay, so you get it. <laughs> All right. Colonial mentality. It means you were once uh, uh, colonized. You know, now you be free, but you will have not free your mind. So now, if you, if you go beyond that and try to bring this up to date. What would it mean if you apply it to the so-called post-colonial predicament, a term that we like to deploy in post-colonial studies or African studies, post-colonial post -colonial predicament or the post-colonial condition? So my next task, what I'm going to do next, I look at what I call, what, what is trauma? OK, so what is trauma? If I'm going to use it to do some interpretive work, what is trauma? And what is this use for literary theory? and criticism, my primary area as a poet writer and a teacher of, of uh, literature. Simply, it is a shattering experience that radically alters an existing frame of reference and consciousness, thus condemning these victims to a compulsive repetition of the past in a doomed attempt to master the catastrophe, to master the experience. It is an, ex an event experienced too soon, quoting a uh, uh, scholar in the field, experienced too soon, too unexpectedly, to be fully known, unquote, thus making it unavailable to consciousness. The compulsive reenactment of the traumatic past haunts the present and threatens the future, even as the victim represses or denies the trauma. In the glossary of Catherine Jones's translation of Freud's Moses and monotheism, where uh, Freud, as you know, does this speculative history of Jewishness. How did the Jewish people emerge from being a people in time to a people in history, people in place? And his argument, tracing the origin of the, uh, tracing it from the uh, Exodus from Egypt, is that over time, you know, dealing with the catastrophe of that event, they became a nation. Now, that's a very Evolved and even convoluted argument. You had to follow carefully. You know, much of it is speculative. But what uh, Kathy Carruth, who I quoted earlier, is, is saying here is that what that teaches us is that we should read history as a history of trauma. And you only need to recall what Benjamin, uh, what Benjamin's famous dictum that uh, every civilization is a uh, 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 record of atrocities, more or less. It's, it's written in, a, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing him now, you know. But well, you know what I'm talking about. It's written in a scroll of uh, atrocities. Now, Derek Walcott, the Caribbean poet, who advocates a poetics of amnesia in relation to the historical trauma of slavery, keeps both meanings alive in his poem. That is the meaning of the wound to physical, physical uh, uh, injury and also a mental injury. In his poem, La Vontio, when he speaks of a wound, some open passage that has cleft the brain, some deep amnesiac blow. Crucially, trauma designates the murky realm, the dark abyss of knowing and not knowing. 
If we read post-colonial history as a history of trauma, I argue, we will gain insights not readily available to us under the dominant discursive frameworks, be they cultural materialists or post-modernists, doesn't matter. If we don't focus, use it as a primary interpretive tool, we don't get as much. We may come close, as I will show you know, in a moment. So for example, we discover new ways of reading, even of seemingly over-analyzed canonical works. I have shown this in a chapter of my doctoral dissertation, entitled this chapter entitled Identity or Death, the Trauma of Life and Continuity in Wale Shoika's Death and the King's Osman, which I claim enables me to answer one lingering question. You know, uh, his argument is as follows. The literal deaths of Shoika's dual protagonist, Eleshi, and his self-important son, Rulunde, portend the symbolic death of a community caught in the abyss of disintegration. I examine the psychosocial impact of this crisis, its anomalies of affect, by drawing on the Freudian notions of Angstbereitschaft, which is unpreparedness for anxiety. And then he also develops through that what he called latency. And then of course we know about transference, a key you know, cate analytical category of psychoanalysis. Then I also borrow from Robert J. Lifting, another psychoanalyst, uh, or at least somebody who does who uses psychoanalysis a lot in his work. Uh, Robert J. Lifting's concept of broken connection and life continuity. My central claim is this: that the stunning impact of colonialism substantially determined the autonomy of the Yoruba community, which, against the evidence, insists on acting otherwise, on carrying on as if its autonomy was still intact, whereas it had been taken away. This particular aspect of the structure of trauma, latency, not realizing what has happened to you, pretending that everything is still normal, and then therefore acting in a way that only ends up aggravating the, the catastrophe, uh, is what explains the paradox of Eleshi's so-called failure of will. I also examine the transferential dynamics that Shoika betrays in writing Osman in England, right inside the belly of the colonial will. A factor, a factor I claim, throws light on his contentious claim that the colonial factor is a mere catalyst, is a mere catalytic incident. I argue that this explains the contradiction that also attends his claim that the book's primary concern is the theme of honor, how to keep the honor and integrity of the Yoruba community intact against an invading alien power. We can now, let's bring this another familiar text. We can, in the same vein, make a quick comparison with the, with the other comic, uh, canonical work that Chavez uh, thinks all apart, aptly titled, you say. The novel on close inspection shares several structural similarities with the play. Achebe's very title speaks to the notion of the shattering of a previously existing cosmological frame, and the non-existent is subtense. In things from apart as in Horseman, we are introduced to both worlds through lyrical descriptions of one, in the one, Okonkwo's wrestling prowess as demonstrated in the fiercest fight since Umofia was founded. And in the case of Eleshi, as a man of enormous vitality, singing and dancing with that infectious enjoyment of life, which accompanies all his actions. Individual vitality connotes communal vigor, all directed by political and juridical autonomy, cultural self-sufficiency, and an independent will. By the end of both narratives, however, vigor and self-sufficiency have been vitiated with tragic consequences to social cohesion. Okonkwo, as a legend, is unable to understand what has happened to him. This is where the question of knowing and not knowing that trauma brings, you know, comes in. He's unable to understand what has happened to him and his kinsmen. So he, he, he asks, what is it that has happened to our people? Why have they lost the power to fight? Okonkwo, now exiled at the time uh, uh, after committing an inadvertent crime, exiled to his mother's land, uh, he has a visit from his friend, Obierika, the one that Chebe tells us things about things. Unlike Okonkwo, the protagonist, who is rash. Obierika is the one that thinks about things. But no matter how much he thinks, 
is unable to recognize that the primary impulse of Okonkwo's actions, that fear of failure, and we are told it's a fear of failure, is also driven by an Oedipal fear, that fear of his father, fear of being like his father. Now, uh, a well-known post-colonial scholar, uh, scholar uh, Yodun J. Ifo, has done an article called, an essay called Okonkwo's Mother, which focuses on the absence of Okonkwo's mother. You don't hear, we don't, his Okonkwo's mother is mentioned only once, and in one tiny paragraph in that narrative, which underscores this beautiful combat. But it doesn't end there. Okonkwo's son, Umoye, is driven to the missionaries, those whom his father is more or less engaged in a mortal combat to drive away from the land. But Okonkwo's son, Umoye, joins the missionaries. And we see from the narrative that it is the trauma of his father driven by the fear of death, or the fear of failure, or being thought to be weak, that leads him to kill Ikeme Fune, the child who was like war reparation uh, uh, for, for Umofia community, given to Okopo to look after, and who had become more or less a member of the household and become an older brother to Ikeme Fune. Okopo kills him, and Umoye is simply shattered. The trauma of it drives him to the church that preaches against such killings in the first place. So he is unable to understand, no matter how much he thinks deeply about things, these interpol, you know, impulses that are work here. And it's what I claim that if we embrace that paradigm, helps us see much more clearly. Now, let me add that in that essay I've cited, uh, BJ's Okonkwo's mother, and another essay by uh, Adebayo Williams, incidentally, a former student of BJ's at the University of Ife, who well, I think is now Savannah College. He wrote an article called um, Ritual and the Political Unconscious in Death and the King's Osman. What the two of them succeed in doing is that they come to the edge of the traumatic, the edge of the psychoanalytical. But because that is not their primary prison, they are not able to exploit it further. So they use the Marxian drawn notion of the political unconscious, for which Frederick Jameson is famous, you know, uh, to come very close to it, but not quite all the way. Now, let, just to make this clear, this whole question of latency and the structure of trauma, let's hear from Freud who in Moses and, uh, Moses and Monotheism uh, defines this aspect of trauma, when it was dealing with soldiers who had returned from the First World War and were betraying symptoms as if they were still at the battlefront. And he was confronted with that problem. It took him a while before he figured it out. So he says, it may happen that someone gets away, apparently unharmed, from the spot where he has suffered a shocking accident, for instance, a train collision. In the course of the following weeks, however, it develops a series of grave psychical and mortal symptoms which can be described only, which can be ascribed only to his shock or whatever else happened at the time of the accident. He has developed a traumatic neurosis. This appears quite incomprehensible and is therefore a novel fact. The time that elapsed between the accident and the first appearance of the symptoms is called the incubation period. It is the feature which one might call latency. So this is what I'm saying happens to the Umofia community, to the uh, or your kingdom, where the autonomy has been taken away, and they're not aware, and they're acting as if everything is still normal. Allegedly, both I'm master of my own fate. But he's not the master of his own fate. So this is, this is, what, I, this is what I'm claiming here. Now, the thing I want to go to now is, how do we bring it up to date? What then are the specific symptoms or manifestations of post-colonial trauma today? And why have we lost, to just you know, echo Okonkwo, why have we lost the theoretical will to uncover and subject them to critical analysis? The, the psychoanalytic phenomenon proves relevant here. We must always be reminded of what Diana Force points out, that Fanon's intersection of anti, Fanon's decision to locate his theory of radical decolonization at the intersection of anti-imperialism and psychoanalysis gave him a vocabulary and an intellectual framework in which to diagnose and treat not only the psychological disorders produced in individuals by the violence of colonial domination, but also the neurotic structure of post-colonialism, or colonialism itself. I'm just adding post to it. It also helps to treat the neurotic structure 
of post of colonialism, post colonialism itself. Now, one such neurosis is what I would call the problem of corruption, which has contributed to no small extent in creating the notion of what we call post colonial pessimism. The idea that these states that emerged, either they were not ready for independence and nothing good can come out of them. The kind of narrative you will find in, say, the V.S. Naipaul, you know, uh, travel or narrative or on Africa and, and tell what, as it usually does anyway. So, how can Fanon then help us understand this? A vocabulary that seeks to understand the non materialist dimensions of these current manifestations by probing the fantasy, the, the, the question of fantasy, desire, the unconscious, envy, aggression, and ambivalence, which are all categories of psychoanalysis. This is the way I think Fanon can help us. Now, to, to show it, I look at the claims that are made by development studies experts who distinguish between <coughs> what they call the disintegrating model of corruption and the integrating one. And the disintegrating one is where various ethnic groups or communities are competing for resources in a country where, where some of them are so disadvantaged that they come to the table either with no chip at all or too few chips to play the game. So they are shunted aside. And in the process, coups, uh, civil disturbances, uh, dislocations, you know, take over. In which case we have actual incidents that lead to trauma. When people like in Sierra Leone, in the war that took place there, people are amputated, uh, people are killed, homes are burned, refugees are created. So there's not a direct link between corruption, which we see as just mere corruption, and then the trauma that follows where wars and civil disturbances and coups take place. Now, uh, the Catholic Church, in looking at the question of corruption itself, also pointed to the way in which it alters the arrangements, the, 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 the um, state institutions, the character of the state institutions you know, that are supposed to preside over the post-colonial state. So the next question will be, so how does all of this work? Um, looking at the time and I'm thinking I should just skip some of the stuff I have here. The way I'm going to go about is to quote uh, a section from Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. There's that famous passage where he says, the look that the native turns on the settler's town is a look of lust, a look of envy. It expresses his dreams of possession, all manner of possession, to sit at the settler's table, to sleep with his wife if possible, the colonized man is an envious man, and this, is, and this the settler knows very well. When their glances meet, he has settled bitterly, always on the defensive. They will want to take our place. It is true, but there is no native who does not dream at least once a day of setting himself up in the settler's place. Now, we have several, we have here, in just this small passage, Several of the key concepts that constitute the psychoanalytic field of vision, lust, desire, fantasy, aggression, the unconscious, dream, and ambivalence. To be well on our way to making bricks with mere straw, as it were, <coughs> let us think of corruption then as a non-violent means by which the colonized dreams of taking the place of the colonizer. For if the colonizer symbolized not only political power, but also an easy and lavish lifestyle, complete with the choicest colonial real estate. In Nigeria, we call it government reservation areas, GROs. Uh, cars, leisure, and recreation, together with a retinue of domestic servants, even where, and perhaps because this lifestyle was sponsored by mindless exploitation and vaulted the colonial officer to a class or social status unavailable to him back in his native Europe. So the dream of possession, all manner of possession that Fano speaks of, is not extinguished by the mere possession of the colonizer's wife. At any rate, not after independence and when they have gone back to, 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 to Europe. By crook or hook, those who have finally taken the place of the departed colonial masters 
how to acquire and sustain the lifestyle associated with power and governance in a modern nation state, such as has, has been handed over to them. Mind you, there was no such state before they came. So the only experience of it they have is as represented by the colonial officer. So they associate that automatically, the lavish lifestyle, you exploit the people, you don't intend to put anything back. That space, in fact, is booty land. It's a no man's land. The, the, whole, the, the whole notion of the nation state, therefore, is a, equated with that of booty land, where as pirates, buccaneers, you just come and grab. So now, it, it therefore throws some light on the phenomenon of corruption that has befuddled everybody, including, this is where Franz Fanon, even without, you know, uh, it is brought up to date, even without intellectuals or scholars having to do the job. The current chairperson of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission of Nigeria, uh, um, I don't know how to call it now. It's like a, a lame dog, you know, uh, organization that is just meant to harass a few people here and there to show that it's doing something, but which is really not serious. Because the people they, want, they should go after are the very people that are pointing them into power. Uh, and so, anyway, it took less Buddha, let's just call it that, you know. But however, this chairperson of the EFCC, our retired police officer, on after the one who was actually more intent on doing something, uh, another police officer, Nuhu Ribadu, was hounded out of office because he was beginning to take his job too seriously. Then they brought in this woman to replace her. Even this minor version, even this woman who was a compromised candidate, who knows why they brought her there in the first place, not to get serious about corruption, looks at a few files and she's stunned. And then she makes this statement, which was published in the newspaper. The Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has advocated psychiatric tests for public office aspirants ahead of the 2011 general elections. Chairman of the EFCC, Mrs. Farida Waziri, made a call yesterday while delivering a keynote address at a workshop on transparency and accountability in public service. She said, quoting her, having dealt with many corruption cases, I am inclined to suggest that public officers should be subjected to some form of psychiatric evaluation to determine their suitability for public office. The extent of aggrandizement and gluttonous accumulation of wealth that I have observed suggests to me that some people are mentally and psychologically unsuitable for public office. We have observed people amassing public wealth to a point suggesting madness or some form of obsessive compulsive psychiatric disorder. Now, this last, this last phrase almost <laughs> like sounds like saying PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. So it, it's, it's a compulsive thing that's got to the level where it is compulsive. So the question I, I asked was, why would people, and like everybody asked, why would they steal this much to begin with? Now, when I was, I was home for five weeks this summer, a good friend of mine, a lawyer, not in politics, but his mother is very, very active in politics. So as a patronage, as a kind of favor to the mother, they appointed him, her son, as the acting chairman of a local government. A local government is a third-tier government in Nigeria and gets revenue directly from, gets the money directly from the federal uh, revenue allocated. It's a lot of money, and you could do a lot of work in the local government. But when he resumed office, he found that they did not have toilets in the secretariat. And the staff had to go to the nearby bush to do their business. And he fell for the women, especially, who had to dash to the bush and squawk. So he said, first thing, we have to build a toilet end to the secretariat. The counselors said, no, they should share the money. So when he was telling me the story, he was with his wife and four children, and godfather to his first child. You know. I said, no, no, you're kidding. Why in the restaurant eating? I said, you're kidding. He said, no. And in fact, that's when the wife joined. He said, no, no, no. You already know heard the half of it. They will not build toilets for them, toilets for themselves. So I wrote an article in The Guardian called uh, Thinking Through the Corruption Complex in France. Then online, I gave it a different title, 
they will not even build toilets for themselves. You know, call up, no, to build, thinking through the corruption complex, which attracted a lot of responses. And I followed it up when I got some interlocutors actually taking me on the paper with what I call decolonizing the mind, you know, uh, corruption, blah, 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 and the Trump, colonial trauma. So the essence of this is that what I'm trying to drive out here is that the kind of attitude behavior that we find that are so perplexing in many a third world country, Nigeria being an instance, where we loot blindly, can't be divorced from the trauma. Not that that's the only explanation. I'm not saying that's the only explanation. But that we have to use that too to look at the mental processes, what Fanon called the anomalies of affect that are responsible for the structure of the complex. What Achebe called, you know, helping the, his people to regain confidence of, in themselves and, you know, uh, put away the complexes of the years of denigration. What the book he called decolonizing the mind. What Farida Waziri, far removed from that world of intellectual, is calling a compulsive disorder here, acquisition, acquisition disorder here. So that's what I'm asking. And I think if we don't use trauma, which he's the nail on the head, is the direct, clearest lens for looking at the way the mind is affected by external stimuli. So we can't probe the psyche without using the tool most uh, 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 fashion for it and trying to do it in a roundabout way, you know, through any other means, as useful as those other means are in other respects. So this is a big claim, if you like, that I'm making here. And I think the more we do this, the more it will become clear to us that the reason why we cannot pay any respect to that space is because it is a space born out of trauma. Why would we not invest in it? Why would we not see it as part of us? What civic ethic can we develop towards Nigeria where we never feel, we never really were Nigerian before colonialism put us together as Nigeria for its own purposes? And then when the needs of decolonization came, we shut that aside and said, okay, well, drive away the colonialists, like Nkrumah put it, seek ye first the political kingdom and every other thing shall be added. Well, all well and fine maybe in Ghana, but we saw what Ghana had to go through before the relative stability that has now come. That is what Nigeria is going through now. We haven't quite, I call it the acting out. We're acting out that trauma of colonialism and that we will have to go take another step, which is the walking through step of that trauma before we can reclaim that space. The phenomenon, I'm going to end on this, the phenomenon of national conferences that racks Africa at the point can be likened to that Call it a transferential space where we take the, the post-colonial national uh, nation state as merely a transferential space, which means a space where you can talk about the trauma, where you can have the talking cure, if you like. Talk about it. It could be the church. It could be any other. It could be any other venue, but all social spaces in which we can talk about our past. And I agree, as a wild act of union on Nigeria, what Nigeria should be. Until we do that. That walking, once we go through that walking through process, the trauma we see dug us, and we keep returning as one famous African American novel, Beloved, so poignantly you know, reminds us. Thank you very much for your patience. Questions? Show them. We want to thank you all again for coming and um, thank Dr. Foano for joining us.